So I'm here with uh, John Gitter, uh, the Chief Technology Officer from Tails eSecurity, and Sebastian uh, from Watson iCloud IBM, and uh, Artem Topping from the Chief Digital Officer from IP Chain from Russia. And I'm Taina Hayes. Uh, I'm the CEO of Moeda Development Bank uh, in Brazil. We do microfinance and microcredit, and we use the Hyperledger to track our projects to bring transparency and trust between investors and the borrowers. Um, today, is, we will be talking about like the work that we do, the, the real deployments and real study cases that are uh, happening today and also the intersection between blockchain, AI, IoT, in the supply chain, and other technologies. So if anyone can introduce yourselves, please, and share a little bit of the work that you have been doing and how the Hyperledger is applied to that. Okay. So, okay, we'll start at this end, why not? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the kind of um, things that I've been looking at have been on both sides of the, uh, the chain technology. So. Um, working with sensitive customers sometimes, or certainly um, safety critical or industrial deployments. Um, you have to take a little bit of license to, to think that what um, I and my colleagues have been doing is terribly novel in terms of use case, because it basically boils down to uh, supply chain management in one way or another in, in, in most cases. Um, but the actual deployments, I think, are, are quite interesting because of the nature of the things that we're dealing with and, and the types of people and businesses they touch. So um, a lot of uh, you know, aerospace defense type um, supply chain cases uh, don't come down so much to the basic provenance and kind of the, the ever-ledger um, final use case where you look at your ring and sort of go through and, and have a look where it came from and you get photos of the nice guy sort of polishing it and stuff. I mean, a lot of the technology is kind of the same, but the deployments obviously have to be uh, rather different because the information is very sensitive. Um, so knowing, um, knowing that a diamond has been mined and then is sort of shipped to um, a place in India where it's polished and then goes to a retailer, there's not a lot of side channel uh, intelligence that you can gain from that. But knowing that parts for a particular specialist aircraft have um, suddenly been manufactured 3x more than they usually would probably tells you something about an operational capability of a, of a nation state that they wouldn't want people to know about. So um, a lot of the technology and the basic use cases are the same, but because of those sort of sensitivities and things, the way that we deploy, the way that we have to configure uh, the machines and um, a lot of the work that... Um, I've been personally much more directly connected to and actually updating things like the cryptography and the implementation strength of Hyperledger technologies uh, is, is, is where my perspective comes from. Wonderful. Yes. Thanks, John. Um, I think we actually are touching already on some very interesting topics. Uh, Everledger was definitely a great keynote this morning and it brought up some interesting aspect that we, we might touch upon. Um, working in the Watson and Cloud Platform team at IBM allows me to, of course, um, do stuff with the clients that want to deploy a blockchain project, because blockchain at IBM being entirely developed on top of the Apple Ledger fabric as a sort of plug and play option uh, on the cloud initially. And we saw this morning, I don't know if you guys were there, um, with our blockchain CTO that now we're rolling on other type of uh, deployments option, but originally it was a cloud um, type of deployments and that allowed us to also work with clients that wanted a more holistic uh, type of solution that was not only touching on blockchain but on other technologies um, like IoT and NAI and I guess we, we're going to see that uh, a little bit later. Um, but personally, I'm really um, attached to the to the topic of fraud, and uh, that's where I see mostly personally the blockchain potential in the following years, both uh, for digital type of fraud and also physical type of fraud or counterfeiting, if you if you will, which it is very hard to do. And we saw this morning with the Everledger example that to do the digital twin of the diamond, they have to have this huge. Uh, camera apparatus, uh, huge lenses, really HD type of photo photography that they have to do, and that's very expensive. So when you have to scale that to small businesses, for example, or you know those enterprises in South America, how do you do that? So I hope we're going to touch down on that. 
hello, my name is Artem Tobin. I am CTO in uh, Association uh, IP Chain in Russia. Um, sorry for my English, uh, because I'm from Russia. I've got more than uh, 15 uh, years in, uh, to develop uh, software uh, in mass media. And uh, uh, in mass media, we've got a lot of problem with the IP. I, I um, deal with uh, films, uh, music, and so on. Uh, and uh, the market of IP now is grow. And um, we've got a lot of problem uh, that reduce to growth this market. Uh, for example, in the, uh, in the world, we don't have a single universal uh, database with uh, the whole information about IP, about the music, about right holders, about the arts, uh, uh, text, patents, and so on. Uh, another pl problem that reduced the growing uh, up uh, of market um, is that uh, uh, this business is non-transparent. Uh, we can uh, exchange information between governments, between uh, big organizations that uh, uh, deal with uh, the IPs. And the third problem uh, is that a lot of falsification of data about right holders we have uh, in uh, ledgers and uh, registers in database in uh, a lot of organization. Um, and as a result, uh, the authors uh, can get a fair royalty to that. And uh, in Russia, we create a situation uh, that uh, uh, trying to solve this problem. I, uh, I think we solved uh, now this problem. We started uh, a, hyper uh, a decentralized database based on Hyperledger Fabric, and uh, we create the association with the government, and now uh, our IP chain, our decentralized database, operate in the production mode in Russian, and we've got uh, about uh, 10 uh, nodes now. This is the big organization that uh, uh, register, uh, that make registration of patents, of uh, arts, of music, and so on. They deal with the right holders. And uh, this is the uh, Hyperledger Fabric is a tremendous opportunity for us to make um, this uh, register is clear for every participant in Russian uh, and uh, for business and so on. Okay. We created inf unique infrastructure and now a lot of partners uh, create uh, uh, their own digital platforms that uses this infrastructure. Uh, these platforms uh, is about the monetization of uh, intellectual property. Uh, for example, uh, one of our partners start a digital platform IPEX, where the arts uh, can. Uh, this is a marketplace for the intellectual property objects, and uh, in Russia uh, we uh, start this platform that uses uh, the IP chain infrastructure. We Thank deal you. about this. Yes. Thank you so much for introducing so it was an amazing uh, work that you have been doing. And there are many challenges, and uh, the technology we know that are getting to a mature uh, point uh, right now is still a lot of work to do into the safety and security of information, and also to bring uh, information that we can trust. We need the hygiene, we need to develop like algorithms that without bias, and the human beings behind the, the code and we need to be aware of and bring the values and bring uh, things that uh, we can really rely to make decisions. So for me, like my challenge was in to bring public-private uh, partnerships and organizations like to understand how we can uh, together hold uh, accountability for the data that we, we have. 
And in, in Brazil, my father was responsible to create this uh, program for uh, providing credit to the small uh, farm families. And we saw a lot of uh, bureaucracy, like the program uh, still uh, benefits a lot of people, but uh, the women, for example, they, they have a hard time to get access to seed capital. Uh, and that is more cultural than just uh, having, having like access is, is more uh, like my country is very machist and as among like many other countries uh, in the world. So the wallet is held by the, the men. So once you have uh, technology that can provide trust, that can provide access and opportunity, and you can work in collaboration with the government to really be strategic about resources that you spend and, and provide more opportunity, that, that is, um, something that we can do and we can like really, really bring change using the technology. So that, that was my challenge and I would like you to share your challenges on bringing such a, a novel like technology to, to the work and how that can transform the work that you do. Well, so the thing, um, uh, again, it's kind of all about infrastructure and underlay for me. The, the challenges with, with getting, um, ages old industrial you know, heavy steel oil whatever um, uh, companies and customers to move is that they've got a lot of sort of value a lot of experience um, and and a lot of cost tied up in older processes and infrastructure and things so if you want to bring the real world and, and add something brand new to it there's always a temptation and there's a lot of um, uh, there's froth on the technology side if we go to these sort of the Bitcoin conferences where everything will change overnight and the entire world will change to fit the new technology. Um, uh, and there's great hesitation on the side of the, the current operatives and the incumbents who are trying to sort of just do their job the way they've done it for the last 50 years. Uh, and they don't come anywhere near meeting in the middle. And so the kind of, techno the, the kind of challenges we have, it's, you, know, you can't really say it's a technology challenge or a business or a social challenge, you know, they just don't quite all fit together. And so making a, a smooth path through um, bringing them together, putting modernization and tech and connectivity where, where it can go and where it belongs, but also accommodating manual processes, politics, um, off-chain governance and things um, where, where that has some sort of higher legitimacy, that's really the essence of all, all of the challenges. And that's where the sort of hyperledger membership and um, participating in the open source community makes so much, uh, so much sense. Uh, because, for example, Ursa, the, um, the new um, single crypto project, um, desperately important because, of course, when you're dealing with small private networks, you probably don't have terribly many um, PN, it depends which technology you choose, but you know, peer nodes or validators or whatever it is you have, um, you need to make sure that the crypto is strong and reliable. Um, and that would be you know, one place. Equally, you know, if you want flexibility, deployment, maturity, you need something that's got a good base of, of support behind it. So it's, it's the usual thing. It's squaring the circle of um, tech utopia with real world is, is always, our, always our challenge. Yeah, so John has a very you know, good point there in saying that technology itself um, is the first barrier of adoption. And as IBM, we try to, to take that, that off by taking uh, technical steps in helping you know, the business partners that we work with. But um, despite being uh, that a problem, you also have the, the business problem itself, which is you, know, you, you have um, a business that really wants to, to create a blockchain network, and they're really motivated to do that. They, they, they see the point, they see the, the, the profit that they can make out of it, they see the business value. But then when it comes to driving the whole industry with them, because you, know, you can have your own blockchain inside your office, but then uh, you know, how are you actually going to scale uh, that to the, to the people that, that you work with, to the businesses that you work with, that's when you know, it starts to be difficult for them to to actually go, go out of their offices and be like, okay, I want to drive this. I'm going to take other people with me. I'm going to take other business leaders with me. And that's where the barrier for me at least is the, the highest because these guys, even though they're very motivated, as soon as they understand that not only they have to change their own business model, not only they have to have a strategic imperative there, 
they also have to drive other people inside, then that's what they start saying, oh, you know, maybe next year. And, and that's the, the strongest barrier for me. And they have uh, a real um, uh, case in Russia that the uh, court of intellectual property uh, now using uh, our network, decentralized uh, register with information about the IP. Um, for example, if we uh, look uh, for the big free major in music, uh, like uh, uh, right holders in music, uh, like Universal, uh, Warner and Sony, they have a lot of uh, conflicts uh, inside their own databases um, because they can't uh, change in real time uh, the information about the right holders and the authors. And uh, then this conflict uh, uh, is appear. For example, uh, uh, Sony uh, may, and the Universal can put at the same time uh, one song in the iTunes and then uh, offers can uh, uh, get their money. And uh, I think uh, that Universal need to get uh, money, royalty, and the Sony. And uh, in, they can uh, resolve this conflict in online. Now in Russia, uh, we resolve this conflict, uh, and uh, if this conflict uh, escalate in the court, uh, court can uh, see the information in Hyperledger uh, register in online in real time and can uh, uh, see the information, the hash, and uh, with this hash they see that right holder and after and uh, what was intellectual property object, what created, and so on. This is the real case uh, challenge in Russia. Wonderful. Yeah, this digital footprint, like for, especially for independent artists, like to have, uh, um, and scientists in the scientific community, and everyone to has like property for their own own work. Like it's is very important. Like in in Brazil, the the way that we register songs is still very old. We go to the library and we put there, and like <laughs> they, they will never, uh, they will never know if you if you wrote the song or or something like this. And but also for the specific uh, governmental ID, every single state in my country has an independency to register. So there is a lot of room for fraud. Mm -hmm. So once you take identity as more than just a piece of paper that the government issues for you, but also like your credit and the way that we, you engage, the way that you engage with the environment, if you save water or not. So identity should be taken as a bigger approach. And I think by correlating the, the data, and we, then we can get information and knowledge and, and wisdom, like that's how we, we should be. And the intersection between what, what we do is not using just blockchain as a, as, a, as a database, but really like working in a way that we can get more uh, autonomous and the smart contracts can come yeah. into place to get that data out there so the artist can take a share in a piece of song that was sold into iTunes or any other thing. And, and the Uber driver can get a share and that other people can get the real like shared uh, economy. So uh, to, to illustrate, I'm very like proud to, to bring here one of the, <laughs> the, the things that, that we make and that is a cold brew coffee. Uh, made from five women from Brazil, and that is like all on the the blockchain. So the the investors, most they are from China, so they get to see the project. And the project uh, we do like a MVP, and we do like a I Combinator type of incubator uh, where we teach the the women in the rural areas how to be entrepreneurs. So this was the same like in the rural areas in Northeast Brazil. We brought like designers and everyone to teach them. We did the first 150 uh, women. They produced 200 bags. We put the bags on the, the high-end store in Sao Paulo and now we are producing to a bigger store and they get to see how to be a, a, an entrepreneur. So we give them the identity, we give them the access to financial capital but also knowledge. 
Like that is a big problem going on with the financial crisis and the, the climate change that people don't see the correlation of, of those things very clearly and that information, uh, they don't have access into those rural areas. And, and they are deeply affected because if the government cuts uh, their big contracts on purchasing food, and if they see themselves uh, that they need to put their product on the market uh, because they no longer have those uh, safe contracts, uh, they need to be entrepreneurs to survive. And that's where uh, the technology can help people to be together, like people from China can invest in a project in Brazil directly with no intermediaries. And the whole blockchain thing brings the digitalization of things. And as we know the demand, and as we know the people, and they have an identity, and they, we can um, really monitor and give them knowledge, I think those are the transformations that we can see in, in many, many areas. In all the supply chain, if you can get to invest in a project and purchase the project, you'll be more conscious about buying things. And, and all the other technologies, IoT and artificial intelligence can bring uh, together more aut aut autonomous decisions, like smart decisions to use the resources in a better way and improve the capacity of people too. If I know that all the women, like they need that metal f to purchase, uh, each single woman, they have one, one capacity to purchase, but if we go as a group, we can negotiate better the price, they can buy directly, the people can uh, really cut down the intermediaries in the whole chain. So I think that is one of the, the, the things that we see, like that the technology, the, the hyperledger also brings the possibility of permission base, so you, you can decide like what will be public and what will be private. And what you decide that will be public is in the hands of, of the people that code. So once you can share uh, with the world like good cases and you make it public, you can create also a lot of uh, knowledge that people can relate. And we see that we can duplicate and replicate projects that we do in Brazil in other areas if people have just access to see uh, what is going on. Like the, the same cold brew coffee we will be doing in Tanzania because someone saw in the website and they said, oh, that's cool, I can replicate that because it was in the public chain. Uh, so I would love you to share other examples and, and that you are, have been working on of like that transformation. You mean from a supply chain perspective or integration of technologies? Can you, like uh, you mentioned to me, the, the ink, that is, that is amazing. I would oh, love yeah, to sure. share more. Um, so, um, as you were saying, you know, you have that beer on the blockchain, and that beer is on the blockchain through a QR code. And, and that is, you know, e easy to do because that's a barrel, and you can apply a QR code on the, on the, on the barrel outside. But then, how do you apply a QR code to an apple or an organic tomato, right? You cannot sell an organic tomato with a, with a QR code sticked on it. That would be sort of weird. So um, one, one of the five technologies that IBM believes in the next five years uh, will drop in the market with a huge scale is what we call the smart uh, crypto anchors. And crypto anchors are essentially a very tiny piece of edible ink that can be uh, embedded into any product. It can be done on an organic tomato as much as it can be done on a pill. So imagine a scenario where uh, there is a, a counterfeiting manufacturer that's counterfeiting pills, selling them into the gray market, and then selling them back um, to another country where the same pills originally were sold. Now, you would not understand the difference. You will not see the difference between those pills unless you try them and then you know the side effects are really bad on you and then you discover that it was a counterfeited pill. So the way that you can actually identify the unique pill is through the, the crypto anchor that can be embedded in the pill and then it can be activated, for example, through um, a specific type of sensor that touches the pill. It can be activated through liquid so you can, you know, um, stick your tongue on the pill and then see the, the crypto anchor reacting to it. 
And then you can also do that with a smartphone lens, uh, pointing the smartphone to the, to the pill and then seeing the, the crypto anchor on the pill. So at that moment, of course, uh, with the smartphone in that case, you're able to see the unique ID of that specific pill through the crypto anchor, which otherwise you would not be able to see. And that allows you to have a granular level of uh, identification, <coughs> then of course uh, can be scaled because that you know edible piece of ink is not expensive and it can be done without being uh, weird with a huge QR code on, on, on the pill itself. So I guess that uh, that's a transformation that I would I would see. Yeah, I mean those, those two things together is um, is really interesting, and it reminds me of the the keynote this morning, the Bruce Schneier's keynote, which you know, I wonder if I'm alone in having found that slightly confusing. And he seemed to spend about half an hour just saying that nothing's perfect and no single tool will solve all our problems. So it doesn't really. You know, it, it's nice, and the words are all fine on their own, but it doesn't really move us along any. Um, I think we all we all know that. Um, uh, blockchain isn't 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 magic, um, but he also sort of rolled out the same old trope that we always hear, which is that you know I've never ever seen a thing that you can do with uh, with a blockchain that you couldn't do with something else. To which the you know for every use case that we all have here, I think you have to invert the question and say, well you know if if it could have been done with something else, then why wasn't it? Um, and so when you're looking at issues of, of trust, actually, so your transparency example, your crypto anchors um, example, and we also work a lot on crypto anchors in electronics, um, putting sort of um, unique crypto into the silicon of embedded chips or FPGA engines and things like that. I mean, I think puffs in general, um, tokenization, physical tokenization is a really important research area. But the, the bigger issue of actually enabling trust with blockchain technology and how you get a transformation um, is the issue of um, accessibility and ease of entry. Because traditionally, if you have trust companies, um, it's never been too far away from the surface that they also kind of hold you to ransom or some kind of toll in order to issue out that trust. It's kind of inevitable. I've worked in this, this industry for 20 years, and, and you can't avoid it. If you're going to run a profitable business, if you're going to pay people's salaries, you end up having to charge for the service. And it kind of ends up being this slightly difficult circle of, um, uh, you know, if I'm going to trust my cell phone, I have to go and ask the one and only central point who has my subscriber information, who happens to be the one and only monopoly provider of telecommunications to me. Not that they have a monopoly in the entire market, but I only have one provider for my cell phone. So you end up having this sort of bizarre inverted trust where you kind of believe that they've got all, you know, you know, all, all the security, but they don't have your best interests at heart. And the really interesting thing that, that, that blockchain brings along is firstly that it's just a lot cheaper. If you do it right, it's a lot cheaper than everybody buying distributed data centers. Um, but also it takes a lot of the onboarding, which usually is a static piece of information. It's just knowledge of a, uh, of a, of a crypto token or it's knowledge of, of where a thing first came from. And it gives everybody a fair playing field to then add value on the top. So I think that's, um, for us, the, the adoption, the sort of opportunity and things that, that we've seen that's really interesting is actually um, where it's been difficult for people to um, either swallow the political commercial issue of trusting a central point or there have been players who are too small to afford an enormous distributed sort of re-centralized Oracle REC system to run on um, that you can actually get started with blockchain technologies. I was also quite confused by the, the yeah. keynote this morning. Um, I partially agree. And um, if you see um, from the IP point of view, everything is uh, that surrounded us is about the IP value. Uh, these items, uh, maybe bottle, iPhones, uh, phones, I think consist uh, ab more about the 50% from the IP value. And we need to um, some ecosystem where we can uh, put the information about this IP value. Uh, and we need uh, that every effort of this uh, IP value can get a royalty and um, could uh, to sign uh, contracts, a license agreement, because the IP is uh, about the, just about uh, license contracts. And uh, 
the hyperledger and the blockchain technologies with the smart contracts uh, can as, can first secure and then speed up uh, to sign uh, this license agreement and uh, get for the efforts the fair royalty i think uh, this all about technology that can uh, make a world best <laughs> Absolutely, I, I agree. Like the, the blockchain is not magic, but it's bringing people to, to wake up, like to implement, like everyone that asks, how can I implement blockchain on my business? That is like, oh, okay, how can I implement trust? And how can I trust my data? Even like the, for the government, it's, it's difficult for the hygiene, like who is inputting the data? Like if they are biased or if they, they are lazy, they, they just copy and paste everything, like you cannot run into a dashboard, into a graphic and make a decision based on that data that was duplicated or just copy and, and paste. So I think the, the other thing that the blockchain brings is that that trust on like no, no duplicates and if we really uh, want to share and like correlate uh, data and make the use of the data t for decision makers uh, in, in the end to make smart decisions, uh, we, we can do that. I, I do see in, in our projects, um, as more projects that we do, more of the coffee, more of the, the fashion and milk and many industries uh, across that, that people can replicate. Once we have like 200,000 projects and people can start to, to look and, oh, I, I have technology to do better of, of this uh, part of the supply chain or uh, people can really share and combine other, other different uh, types of technology as well. And the Hyperledger is quite flexible uh, for that. We have integrated with the uh, Ethereum protocol and the Stellar protocol for the, the micropayments. And I think that uh, was a, a big uh, thing. So today is the, the, our Hyperledger is managing the other blockchain protocols. So we took the best of each protocol, <laughs> the Ethereum for doing the remittance, the Stellar to do the micropayments, and the Hyperledger to manage them all and to make public what is to be public and private, the sensitive information. And, and the privacy of that. So um, let's talk about right now like the other different protocols and other types of technologies that you have been using in intersection with the Hyperledger that you wanted to share. So I guess that um, you, you had there a really interesting point, which is the one about data. And you were saying, you know, you have these uh, people in, in Brazil, public offices, injecting data in a laptop, and then the data is going somewhere, is maybe used in some way. And that, of course, um, brings the whole issue of, of data, which, in my opinion, is the common denominator between artificial intelligence and blockchain. And, and the, the two technologies can be, can be combined. We are not there yet, but I, I think it will happen in the near future. And the way that um, we see it happening is through um, federated and trusted artificial intelligence. That's um, uh, maybe an, a new term, but what essentially is, is you know, you have all these devices collecting data in an IoT environment, and uh, usually those data will be then ingested, pipelined into a central server where there is a learning model, a machine learning model, data science model, whatever you want. Um, the model learns, and just the data learns, learns more, and then sends back inputs, uh, generates insights, and then um, whatever those terminals um, or sensors were doing before, then after the training of the central model, they do it better. But then, um, uh, you know, when, when you want to, to secure that uh, with a blockchain system, you cannot do that. So you need to ship, essentially, the, the learning model to the devices themselves so that the learning happens in the device at the local level rather than in a centralized way. And, and then, you know, at the, at the unit level, you have the model getting the data, learning, and then 
having some updates in a way. And, and you want to, of course, balance all of them because um, if, you, if, you, if you have only one device learning one thing and all the others learning that, then all, devices, all the other devices would be faulty on that specific thing. So you need to still have a centralized sort of learning model. But instead of having all the data done, um, ingested in, in a centralized way, you have it weighted. And that's the concept of, of federated AI. But then, um, because you know you want to make the sh make sure that the data is not biased, um, then you can basically use blockchain to track the the model at the at the sensor level, and then basically trace how the model um, communicates with the with the sort of central training model. And I think that can be one of the futuristic uh, sort of integration between the two technologies. Um, and, and IoT, of course, so that would be three technologies. Yeah, so I mean, that, it's an interesting thing to consider if, if people are sort of wondering which technologies to use, what deployment models to use, and so on. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of information out there um, about, and especially since we've just published the performance and scale um, information, you can sort of see if I want to be on a small device, I've got to use Iroha because it's sort of specialized for that. If I want to have um, node hierarchies, I have to use Fabric because it has hierarchies. If I want to have EVM, then you know, I'll go use Burrow, but it's got proof of stake, so now I've got you know, all of the sort of standard um, considerations for practical deployment and um, crash tolerance and things I think we're well versed in. Um, something that is less well studied and, and less well developed is the active adversary cases and the kind of technologies and extra um, decisions you have to make if you think you are actually genuinely going to get attacked. Um, and, and attacks don't tend to happen in the form of um, somebody opportunistically takes over a little more than a third of your nodes and sort of just takes what it can get. It happens in sitting and waiting for several years at a time until the specific person you want is in the specific car that you've compromised and then you go crash that one. Um, so you know, there's an awful lot of, of, of stuff out there that we, that we don't know. It's something I've been looking at. Um, yeah, fairly, uh, fairly hard um, in the, the topic of AI um, is that poisoning of models is becoming a really interesting concern. Um, you know, the, 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 there are people working on better versions of AI, but right now, effectively, the, all we've got is um, uh, trained learning sets, and the more data you get, the better, and so you want to bring in a absolute ton of data from as, as, as much as you can, as different as you can, in order to give as much experience to the model as you can. And the problem with that is that you've got this huge conflict then between, you know, do I have a little bit of very well-known data, or do I just take data from everywhere and risk that I'm going to be told that um, you know, something is, is, is not what it is. Um, and of course, we, we have perfectly good data integrity issues. You can only buy data from known sources, for example. You can sign it. You can keep it locked away in a center. This really is a case where, you know, why use a blockchain when we've got lots of other technologies around? Uh, but something I think is interesting with blockchain technology is, um, again, this sort of ease of access and having a lot of provenance data so that you can prove where things came from. Um, the ability to buy a little bit of niche data from a tiny company that's only got three people and no cash budget um, is currently not on the table. You can't train self-driving vehicles on, uh, with those guys. You have to either get completely free data, which has no provenance whatsoever, or you have to buy from big providers who have the uh, at least enough budget to hire a biz dev person to sign the contract. And there's a huge amount of really interesting stuff around the edges that isn't currently really available in a trusted form. So I think joining together um, stuff like you know, crypto seals and embedded um, hardware security and IoT devices, all, the, all of those things around the edges, and coordinating it all through a, 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 an open, trusted blockchain network. I think that's going to be an interesting um, bit of facilitation. And I think uh, that uh, this question about more, more about the requirements, uh, not the technologies. If the industry uh, have uh, opportunity and uh, have uh, some business requirements, technical requirements, uh, and uh, if the in, the in some industry, uh, for example, IP, maybe uh, a raw market, raw market industry, and goods industry, can get the opportunity and uh, make uh, the some association that can uh, get uh, some uh, requirements. 
I think that the community of, for example, the Linux Foundation uh, can uh, get a, a needed platform and needed uh, specification protocol and so on. <laughs> I think uh, like this, yeah. Yes, sure. There is a lot to, to grow. And I think the community is the, the most important for us, like even like to fight sub cyber war like and everything and re really bring privacy to the data that is that is needed. And also the Hyperledger Indie, like the self-sovereign ID and like more of those things like where we can govern uh, the information that we share. Like those are, I think, topics that are important for, for our community to to be like more more active and to develop like specific uh, things into uh, secure uh, the data that is shared, uh, so people feel more <laughs> even more trust in sharing uh, that data for for the common good uh, knowledge. So, if you want to talk about more of the the security and safety uh, parts of like what you're doing, like yeah. into the military and like all the. Yeah, for sure. So I think the, um, uh, the the sort of interesting thing back on the sort of the title of, of this session is um, uh, why we're using blockchains in the first place. And I think you know, we, meaning the sort of global mm -hmm. eternal we, um, is always to solve some problem that other people have. And the problems that we have in um, you know, the physical world uh, is that there are a lot of checks that, that go on. People have to verify and they check one, two, maybe even seven times that the pieces of machinery that are running the world are correct, that they're well made, that they're well installed, and that they're maintained on the correct, the correct kind, of, uh, kind of schedule. And that's just desperately expensive to do in, in many ways. Um, but it's also very scary to change because we know um, that we have a world that kind of works. And whether it's good or not doesn't matter. It's the world we've got. And so people are kind of used to it and happy. Uh, and so we know that on some sort of far off distant plane, we could have fully connected smart cities. Another thing, you know, IBM are, are, are really great at doing the, uh, the connected city um, vision stuff. But one thing that holds us back from actually doing it is that you, know, you have fire hydrants that work today because you, know, you can't interact with them yeah, auto automatically. You can't turn them off or set them off uh, over the internet. Great thing. You know, and you can, you can repeat that times uh, you know, a thousand different kinds of bits of civil equipment. And so um, when we're looking into the safety side of things, um, you've got to have a really good, clean story for why this connected thing orchestrated and secured by blockchain is better than not a database, not you know, whatever other funky thing people have come up with, or an internet API service, or the cloud, or whatever the cloud means, but actually no tech whatsoever. The, 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 the real issue with a lot of these um, cases is that you're going from manual and paper and um, slow time humans to automation all in, all, in, all in one go. And so this is why, uh, just to give you an example, right, if, if you're looking at um, anything that carries passengers, whether it's, you know, whether it's military or not, it doesn't matter. Anything that carries passengers has an awful lot of safety uh, requirements behind it um, that carry legal liabilities, that carry prison sentences, and, and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and so if you take it in for service, then you've got lots and lots of things to look through. And typically with um, aeroplanes and, and ships and so on, um, if they're flying or they're at sea or they're even underwater with certain kinds of boats, um, if something goes wrong, it has to get fixed. And you're not going to phone home and get something assured and wait for people to come. And you know, you're going to fix it there and then and make sure it's OK. And then what actually happens on the maintenance schedule is you go through all the things that are different. You look for um, how you know, variant you are from the, from the approved state of the thing when you left. And you clock it all, clock it all down. Uh, and this takes quite a long time, because you'll have different suppliers, different specialists, different people. Um, who, who get to do that thing. So when we bring in connectivity, automation, uh, with blockchain, but also with web services, also with databases, also with USB sticks, because a lot of these things are actually not strictly connected, um, they're all air-gapped. Um, uh, when, when we talk about connectivity, what you're actually doing um, is replacing physical acts of people entering buildings and going and inspecting a thing and ticking a spreadsheet and then going back and filling in the electronic form of their spreadsheet and then you know, you're replacing all of that activity with something else. And, and the, the issue 
um, that, that you have to overcome is making sure that the understanding and the maturity of the technology, so it's the reality and the perception, um, is accepted as better than, because we've already got one thing, so the new thing has to be better, better than the trust and understanding that we have in physical human beings going and inspecting and doing their um, traditional traditional thing. So it's not as different as it, as it might seem. It seems very sort of Hollywoody to, to look after these things, but actually it becomes very simple. We have a system today, we have a world that works, um, and all you have to do, to varying degrees of strength, but all you have to do is to convince people that whatever it is you're going to replace the current world with is better than, than, than what you've already got. I think that um, unless you're trying to, to finish it because people are, no? No, no, okay, no, okay. So I think that at, as of now, the, um, uh, the way we do business is not by trusting the entire supply chain because you cannot trust the entire supply chain. You don't know the entire supply chain. You know the ones close to you, you maybe trust them, but mostly you believe that and you hope and you have faith that everything is going smooth and nothing bad is going to happen. But then when you start digging deeper, and we see that most recently with all you know the data explosion that is there, so we are actually able to see what happens in the end, um, we've seen a lot of industry getting crooked. And one of them is the advertising on, online advertising tech industry, which started back in 1994 when AT&T published their first ad on Hotwired, which is uh, what Wired is today, and their the, their ad was like, click your mouse here. Now, if you would see that today, you probably just close the entire browser. But back then, it had a 50% click-through rate, so it was crazy, but it was the first one. And, and then companies started seeing a possibility there, so agencies started to pop up, and they're like, you know, AT&T, you don't have to call Otwide anymore. We do that for you. So call, you know, ask us, we call them for you. And then, uh, on one side, AT&T was, was the advertiser and Hotwild was the publisher. There was an agency in between. From then till today, we have more than 5,000 players in the industry. There's a crazy guy in the UK called uh, Steve Binker. He made a huge graph with all these guys. It's mind-boggling. And all these guys in the supply chain, they have a, they have a purpose. They, they do some data analysis, they place the ad somewhere. And throughout the supply chain, we went from having, back in end of 90s, um, a split between agency and publisher of 0.15 cent of a dollar and 0.85 percent of a dollar for the publisher. Now we have something like 0.20 percent for the publisher. And along the supply chain, because you have all those players there, the fees are somewhere there, but nobody actually knows where they are on each side of the advertiser and the publisher. And maybe the advertiser and the publisher, they trust the players close to them that everybody is doing a good job, but that actually is not happening the way they hoped. And that's why you know, big companies like Unilever, they, they dropped their advertising budget, their online advertising budget in 2017, and they started exploring blockchain. Um, and they did it uh, this year, and they're already seeing the results because now they're able to trace before the ad reaches the, the publisher where the fees are getting spread. And so they trust um, those guys that are on the blockchain with them because of course you know, they, they're, they're tracked so, so they cannot get fooled. But I guess that you know, the, the shift that blockchain is bringing in terms of trust is exactly there. It's not about faith anymore but it's really about uh, trust. And, and that is need of trust within our community too. And as more that we deliver and deploy the technologies, uh, more professionalism that we bring to, to the entire blockchain industry, that is good for everyone as well. Like more projects that get from the ICOs to, to actually being implemented, uh, the good that does for the entire community. So thank you for sharing. And let's open, we, we still have a bit time to open up questions, so feel free to later um, um, uh, ask us di directly if you have any questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone.